So, um, next session is um, about improving adoption uh, of Power BI and of your Power BI reports by, and he's also known as the, the data goblin. And um, he actually went from, um, I read it on his, uh, on his LinkedIn, <laughs> it's quite funny, um, from, from using the fruit fly uh, as a genetic model to helping organizations become uh, data driven with Power BI. So if you want to uh, share something um, about how you started, um, I could, that would be, uh, would be great. So take it away. <laughs> That's a very long story. <laughs> we'll keep that for another time. Yeah, indeed. So um, yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Arno, for the very nice talk. So I'll just share my screen. Give me one moment. Um, all right. So you should see my screen now. I will be sharing from uh, the reading view in PowerPoint, so you will see the bars at the top and bottom, but that's because of the resolution of my screen. So just so you know, hope it's not inconvenient. So um, I will be telling you a story today about uh, report adoption uh, and how we can improve the uh, adoption of our Power BI reports. And I'll be doing this with the help of Clonk the Data Goblin. Uh, if you don't know who Clonk is, uh, you will by the end of this talk. And if you don't like goblins, well, I, I guess I have some bad news for you because there's a lot of them in this talk. So um, so if there's one thing that uh, Clonk has learned, it's that if no one is using your solution, then it's not a good solution. So this is no fantasy. It's not something that just goblins experience. I think it's something we all can relate to to some extent. Because if you really look widely, like just cast a wide net and look at 10 random data projects, how many of those 10 do you think will fail? How many of those will really bring real business value and how many of them will not? Uh, of course, being able to do such a study, being able to gather that kind of data is very difficult. Uh, some have tried and research that's been done in the recent years indicates that it's as high as eight in 10. So 80% of data solutions that fail to realize that business value, that's a lot. And when you boil it down, unsuccessful adoption is a big part of that, or even a uh, failure criteria unto itself. So this is of course not what we want. So how do we improve the adoption of our Power BI reports? I'll be talking about two ways that we can do this. There's of course many, many things that we can do, but I'll just be focused on two. So the first is being able to define and measure success in our reporting project. This is something that already we should start early on in the design phase of our report and then follow through when we're building and testing it and continue monitoring once we set that report into production as a continuous support project process. So first, I'll talk about ways that we can easily and sustainably measure this. And next, I'll talk about ways that we can monitor this and how we can do this uh, in a way that really tells us some useful information about whether a report is being used and whether we're really realizing the adoption target that we have set for ourselves and how we set that in the first place. So, of course, being able to define and measure success is one thing, but really it's essential that we can continuously collaborate with the business users of our report. So in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about this um, because if we stop engaging our users at some point, uh, then this will have a detrimental effect on the usage of our report, which is why we need to continuously collaborate with our users, uh, engaging them and understanding their point of view and their needs. Uh, this will not only help them be able to use our report in a more effective way, but also improve the data literacy in our organization overall, improving the value that these users can take out of not only our report, but other data solutions that exist in our organization. So to illustrate all of these points, I'll be using a hypothetical business case, uh, but that one that's grounded in real world experiences, and I think experiences that we all can relate to to some extent. So. First, uh, a little bit about me. So I am, as you might hear from my accent, from Canada originally. I have lived in Belgium since 2012. I did used to work as a geneticist, 
Um, and since 2018, I've been working for Dina as a data visualization consultant. And uh, data is something I love very much. So I do a lot of data hobbying and like to play around with it, of course, outside of work. Um, since COVID started, I've also picked up inline skating as uh, something, you know, I'm Canadian, so I do like to play hockey, play street hockey. Once the rules maybe are a bit more lax, if anyone wants to play, let me know. Um, and as you can tell from this talk, I am an avid, avid fan of tabletop role playing games. This last point is particularly relevant for us because today uh, we are going to do some role playing. Specifically, we're going to role play our business case. So our business case is that we are working for a very large e-commerce company that distributes a wide range of products. So specifically, the name of our company is Dumbledelps Equipment and Adventuring Deliveries Incorporated, but we're better known by our moniker, Dead. So our business or what we really do is that we sell and ship products, uh, adventuring equipment and magic items from coast to coast. We're very good at it and we sell a lot. Uh, so much, in fact, that this has really become a challenge for us. We've been growing tremendously in the last two years. Uh, things are going very, very well, but this is becoming very difficult because in areas where our business are becoming more turbulent, it's very problematic for us to be able to see where exactly it's going wrong or just to be able to get a grip of what is happening in our organization at all with respect to data. So the Excel health that uh, uh, Arnaud was talking about earlier, we feel that a lot. So what we need is we need some good data driven insights from uh, some useful reports. We need some Power BI reports that are going to be able to show us what's happening in our organization and where we can make decisions that are really going to matter. So what we really want, however, is we want to sell more products to more customers in a more effective and data driven way. We've already taken some strides in the right direction because Clonk and his team, uh, who are these citizen developers who've been who've been building Power BI reports and collaborating together to do so, they've learned how to design effective reports with some best practices so that they're sure that they're designing the reports right. Uh, but they also have been collaborating with the users and learning how important it is to do user design co-creation so that they can be sure that they design the right report. So with a combination of these two things, Clonk and his team, they really feel like they've leveled up their report design. The first design that they've come up with um, that we feel is going to really take our reports to the next level is a report focused on growing the strength of our profit in our organization. So this report is something that they've already designed and they're now in the build phase. Uh, it gives a three second overview of our profit situation and how we're doing versus a prior year. In 30 seconds, we can pick up some actionable insights and focus on the pain area, which is for us right now, uh, these past due payments. Uh, so customers owing us money for very expensive magic items. And uh, in 300 seconds, we can really dig into those profit pains to see which customers should we really focus on, which products are we past due for, so that we can really send that to the customer and take action. So this is a great first step. We've got a first report design that's being built now. Um, in fact, the report is already pretty much ready with the data set uh, and the report separated. And uh, so, of course, but we have a lot of things that we want to do. As an organization, we have a lot of different data and there's a lot of possibilities for us to be able to really become a data-driven organization. So on top of that, Clonk and his team have only really stuck their foot into the pool of design, and they really know that uh, creating a successful report is much more than just having a successful design. So while they have leveled up, they have gained some experience, there's still a lot of experience to be gained. So, and they're fully aware of that, but more importantly, so is our executive. Because she has seen many effective designs before and once they got into production, no one used those reports. So she wants to make sure that if this is something we're going to invest in, if we're going to do this, let's really make sure we do it right. So what she proposes is a first phase, that we have a limited region release. We just target one of our largest commercial regions with about a dozen sales teams. 
we monitor that release and we really measure it and see how it goes and we go from there. So what she proposes for this regional release is uh, she lays out some clear expectations. She says, all right, what I expect is that this report will convey consistent and clear, uh, accurate data, uh, that the sales teams will be able to use automation and insights provided by this report to increase the effectiveness. And if we're successful here, that she's really willing to sponsor a larger analytics initiative. And this is something that for Klonk and his team, this is a bit of a dream come true because they have a lot of ideas. There's Our company is just overflowing with data. So there's a lot of things that they want to be able to do. And they know that our executive really believes in transforming our organization in a data-driven way. However, in this discussion, it's, it's a bit of a difficult discussion because when our executive, when she really brings this up and says, okay, you know, how will we know if we're successful? That's when Klonk stutters a bit and he has a hard time answering that question. It seems like such a simple question, but it's one that he has a very difficult time answering. So after this meeting, the C-level meeting, Klonk and his team, they kind of gather together. They pour some extra strong coffee, uh, extra hot as well. And they really get to the core of this question. How will we know if we're successful? They start sharing some ideas, passing it back and forth. And one of Klonk's colleagues, uh, known as Bink, uh, Bink the backend data goblin, she stands up, she has a lot of ideas, and she just goes to the whiteboard and she starts sketching them down. She's very caffeinated, so she's very enthusiastic. She says, well, we'll know we're successful if we did two things. First, we made a quality report, so we made a good report. And second, we set and reach our adoption targets. Everyone shrugs, like, I eh, can agree with that. So, but what does that really mean? What does it mean to make a quality report? And she sketches it out. She says, we have to do four things. Our report has to be complete, meaning that when users arrive to a report, that they have all the information they need to be able to answer the questions that they had when they came to our report in the first place. If they can't do that, then they're probably not going to come back when they have those same questions in the future. So second, our report has to be accurate because when our users come to our report, they're really looking to be able to make some data-driven decisions with the visuals, with the data that we're presenting. So if our data, if our report isn't accurate, then neither are the opportunities or the decisions that our users are going to make with that report, with the data. That's something that's not good for them, but it could even harm our company. And that's not something we want because if that happens, our users, probably aren't going to come back to our report either. It will really damage their trust in the solutions that we're making. So third, we want our reports to be performant, meaning that uh, users, they are very busy. They have a lot to do. They have their own jobs. They're not just going to sit around all day and wait for the reports to load. On top of that, it's just not a very pleasant user experience. So we need to make sure that our reports are performant, that they load quickly, and they can deliver the data on time and on demand. Finally, we have to ensure that our reports are accessible because if we deliver something to the users that isn't accessible, that they have difficulties using for a variety of reasons, you better bet that when they look at that, the first thing that's going to come to their mind is how do I get this in Excel? How do I export this? And then our report is just going to become a glorified Excel export and that's not what we want either. So if we fail to do even one of these things, then we have not made a good report. We have not succeeded. So we need to make sure that our reports are complete, they're accurate, they're performant, and they're accessible. And to do that, we really have to make sure that we have some kind of a way to measure it so that we can be sure for ourselves instead of being subjective, and we can also show it to our stakeholders. So how do we measure this? To do this, we're going to need to use some tools. So I'm going to focus more on the use cases of the kind of tools and methods that we can use. Uh, if you want to know some more technical information, I've written about it on my blog site, so you can check it out there. So this first tool that uh, Klonk and his team are going to use is uh, they are going to use a combination of Teams and the Power Platform, including Power BI, to really be able to derive some user-driven insights about their data, 
about the completeness and about the accuracy. So the use cases here is uh, they're going to do a user story review to assess the completeness of the report if it has all the information the users need. Next, they'll integrate this as a part of their user acceptance testing or UAT to assess accuracy. And this will help them quantify processes, automate tasks, and continue user co-creation after the design throughout the building and the testing phase uh, of the report. So when we say uh, that our report is complete, what we really want to know is are all the relevant questions answerable? So one way we can do this is by doing a user story review by the users, this last part being very essential. So we can bring out all the user stories that we defined early on in the project during the design stage, and we can let the users bucket those into either possible or not possible. We can then count these in order to quantify this, but then focus on what's not possible according to the users to address whether we can implement this in our report using a different approach or a new approach, something like this, uh, or whether we can find an alternate approach outside of a report to help the users be able to do what they need to do. Now, it's very essential that we let the users be the ones who drive this process. They have to be the ones who make the verdict on what is or is not possible, because what we're trying to do is to find out if they're going to use our report, right? So Bink actually illustrates this to Klonk with an example. She explains that the other day she was uh, working on a specific user story about drilling down into the products for a specific customer. So for these past dues, it's very critical that we see which customers are past due and what are they past due for. So she decided to approach this by having this interactive tooltip where if you hover on the customer, you instantly see this customer has 45K past due and these are the products they're past due for. So she was very satisfied with that. She felt it fulfilled that requirement uh, and it was an elegant way to not display too much information. However, when she gave this to the user in this exercise, he marked this as not possible. And when he explained it to her, he said, well, I need to be able to take this out of the report because I have to send it to the customers so that I can really tell them what they're past due for so that we can drive that conversation so that we can get rid of the past due. So I can't really do that like this because then I have to futz around and try to take a screenshot of this tooltip. It would be much better for me if I could just drill through onto another page or to have it just be a drill down as a part of the same table. So, and this is something that Bink, you know, it seemed obvious, but she didn't think about it at the time. So it illustrates the concept. Now, how this really works is that the users can do this all through Teams. Um, there's uh, other ways to do it, of course, but uh, the user then can review the story as possible or not possible, which will trigger a flow in Power Automate. This can shuttle the data into something like either a flat file or Azure Blob Storage. Uh, and this will push it into uh, a Power BI data set uh, with that same flow, which will refresh it um, so that we have all of the aggregated insights being displayed in a Power BI report, which is inside of the Teams channel, inside of the Teams group, uh, showing the results. So this is what it really looks like. Uh, so the user drags it into the user story into the possible bucket and has finished doing this review. So the flow is then triggered, or it can be initiated manually, as it will be done here, which will shuttle the data, in this case, into an Azure Blob container. This is going to be presented back to the user and the developers in a collaborative environment in Teams to show them how the project is progressing in general, but also what the results are of this user story review. So when he resets this tab, refreshes the tab, you can see that all of the user stories have been reviewed. The user marked three as not possible. And we can also use this to kind of drive the discussion about those specific user stories. So if we select one of them that aren't possible, for example, we can see that at some point during our sprint, it was actually blocked for a few days, which is maybe relevant information when we're revisiting, you know, why this is impossible and what happened here. So the user, they marked three stories is not possible. So why did they do that? And what do we do about it? Uh, so the first one is that they needed a comparison to a quarterly forecast. This isn't something that originally came up in the design discussion, so it seems to be a new requirement. 
The second is that they needed to see the data aggregated in a different way. They wanted to have a rolling 12 month aggregation. So the third thing is that they wanted to see the profit expressed not only as a gross total, but also per unit sold. Now we could just add all of these things to our report, but let's have the discussion with the users and figure out what exactly this is and why they want to have this in the report. And that's what Klonk and Bing do. They decide to survey the sales teams uh, in this commercial region where they're going to have the release to see if this reflects just the people who are doing the uh, the user stories or the broader sales community. What they see uh, for the survey for the profit per unit sold is that actually 12 out of the 14 sales teams, they either do this today in their reporting or they agree that this would be something that's very useful. So clearly this is something that they should implement in the report. For the rolling 12 month aggregation, they find out that only four of the teams uh, really need or want this. And it turns to be because uh, it's a very specific way that they run their business. So they run some very specific niche businesses and they think about the data in a slightly different way. So they're used to doing this with Excel today uh, and Clonk and Bink, they talk and they decide with the users that this would be a good use case for Analyze in Excel. So the users can connect to the Power BI dataset, can reuse that version of the truth and still continue to work with the data the way that they're used to working with it. For the quarterly forecast, they find out that only one sales team really has a complete and consistent quarterly forecast. So this sales team is already quite data driven themselves and they're doing a lot of their own analyses. So they have an analyst on their team that's very active also with Power BI. So Klonk and Bink think it would be really helpful for that person to connect to their data set and then in a Power BI composite model with a direct query to the data set and then combining it with the Excel file using this new feature it has been available since uh, December, uh, that this would be a really good way to enable this team to be able to get their own uh, anal analytics, their own insights, but still reuse that data set that they developed. So it's important that they find solutions for what the users feel is not possible because if this exercise was skipped, then they would find all of these things out when the report was in production, and these would be things that the users are telling them why I don't use your report, which is what they don't want to hear. So the result of the exercise was that they increased user involvement during the building and testing of the report, which resulted in them finding and filling some gaps that they didn't know existed before. So they also reused that same technical approach for UAT, which was a very easy way to drive the UAT and uh, also just was a simple way for them to um, be able to identify bugs and to communicate that to the users. Now, completeness and accuracy, it's something that can always be a threat. So Clonk and, and Bink, they've taken some measures to be able to measure this, to secure this, but any change they make in their data set or even the growth in data volume can introduce small changes or small little tweaks that can over time result in a regression or in the worst case scenario, a complete breakdown of the data set or the report, which is of course not something we want to have. And when it comes to unreliable data, this is really a boss monster that we're facing. This is the biggest threat for our adoption. If we release a report and it's perceived by the community to that we're releasing it to, uh, in this case for Clonk and Bink, the sales community as being inaccurate, as being wrong, well, they're they're going to come under fire, definitely, and that's not going to be so good for their reports. So, what can we do about that? Well, we have to set up some kind of data quality monitoring, and we have to do this in an automated way. So let's set up some automated regression monitoring, and that's what uh, Clonk and Bing decide to do. They want to easily monitor whether the data regresses, whether there's uh, the data quality changes, uh, and also the completeness. So the use cases here is to have automated detection of changes in historical data, which normally in their case shouldn't change. Maybe in your case it's different and you might expect that to change, but in their case it's not. The 2019 sales, 2018 sales should stay the 2019 sales. 
So they also set up some automated validation of fixed truth business data. So things like how many uh, commercial regions do we have or how many product groups do we have? Something that they don't expect to change overnight. So related to this, they set up some data alerts that will notify them on one hand that there was a change, but then on the other hand, more importantly, be able to initiate some downstream actions with Power Automate or other tools which can really uh, take actions to prevent the business from seeing and interacting with that incorrect data. So how does this work? Uh, well, when Clonk and Bing, when they finish this, the, this, uh, the testing of their data set that they've done with the users, they reach a certain point where they feel confident in the quality and completeness of that data set. So at this point in time, they split the data set into two. So there is the production data set, the production model, which is the, going to be the one that's refreshed daily and which serves the users for their daily reporting needs. There will also be the historical model, which remains at a fixed point in time, which reflects that scenario where everyone was feeling confident in what that data was. What they then do is they connect to the production model and at the same time to the historical data set and make a hybrid using the new feature to create a composite model uh, for Power BI datasets and Azure Analysis Services. Uh, and then they can mathematically compare the measures for both models for the historical data to see automatically whether it's changing or not, when they would expect in this case it to be the same. On top of this, they also collaborate with the business who provides them a flat file. Uh, this flat file serves them some business baselines which is data that the business feels should not change. So they compare uh, between the production model, the historical model, and this business baselines file to have an automated regression monitoring report, which can be able to tell them if there is an issue with the quality of the data. So they also expose this to the users to help build confidence that that historical data is not going to change, to be transparent in their process. Uh, but more importantly, they set up some data alerts uh, related to, to dashboards that are connected to this report so that they're automatically notified if a regression is detected. So connected to these data alerts, they set up some flows in Power Automate, which can then do things like notify their group in Teams or possibly even user groups if they have a Teams user group for the users. Uh, more importantly, however, this can trigger some other downstream actions. Like, for example, through Azure Functions, it could initiate a PowerShell script, which through the Power BI REST API for the deployment pipelines will prevent the movement of the refreshed production data set from the quality to the production environment, which is normally a scheduled process, um, thus preventing the business from seeing and interacting with the incorrect data in a fully automated way so that they can really dig into the data set and try to solve that problem, figure out what happened. So how this really looks like is you have then in blue the historical model and in red the production model. Um, so this is an instance with a single fact table and you just connect the dimensions to the fact across the two models and then set up some measures that are going to mathematically compare what you want to detect the regression for. So what you would expect is that everything is zero. This is a good scenario. That means that the historical data is the same as the uh, historical data in your production model and there should be no difference. However, there might be one day where that data set refreshes and when it finishes refreshing that it is no longer zero. And that's what you see here that from one day to the next our sales went down, uh, historical sales went down by 48,000 gold pieces which is a lot of gold pieces. And uh, this turns out to be actually, if you look at the report, so they can all, not only see that this regression happened, but they can see where it happened in terms of the, uh, the time series, but also with their dimensions. So they can see that this is only a single line for the product type. And through this, they actually figure out that there was an issue with a join for the product master data. So not only were they automatically informed, uh, but they could also use this report for a root cause analysis to figure out what exactly happened in the backend system that they have to rectify uh, or in their Power Query ETL um, uh, in order to solve the problem. 
So the result is that they were able to measure and monitor the completeness and accuracy of their data. And it was something that really gave them more confidence in their solution looking forward. However, they are aware that no solution is foolproof. And while they might have taken some measures to defeat unreliable data today, tomorrow is always a new day, so they need to remain vigilant. So they've addressed data completeness by doing the user story review and data accuracy uh, using the UAT and also with this automated regression monitoring. So how do we then look at performance? So when Fink is, is discussing this with their team, Klonk mentions, yeah, okay, I know, you know, I use the performance analyzer for this, so I'm I'm quite comfortable with that. And she says, okay, but you know, it's really important that we pay attention here because in the next phases, data volumes are gonna get huge. Right now we're talking about one commercial region. And yes, it is our largest commercial region, but there are 34 commercial regions. So we are going to be talking um, upwards of 100 million rows potentially. So we gotta make sure, Clonk, that anything we're going to be building in our model is going to stand that test of time. So we gotta make sure that we have some robust test per procedures uh, for testing that performance. So there's many ways to measure performance. Um, and uh, Bing, she asks Klonk just to demonstrate how he does it today so that they can uh, work out a standard process within their team. So Klonk, he opens the report, he takes out the performance analyzer, and uh, he refreshes the visuals. And he illustrates, uh, see the gross profit visual, it's a bit slow, um, we should be much better. And Bing says, okay, so I can guess here, you know, in order to dig into more details, you probably export it. Uh, you take the JSON file, and then you have a report that tells you some more insights about this or something. And Klonk is not particularly technical, so he doesn't really follow what she's saying. He just says, no, 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 no. I, I, the only JSON I know is the one in accounting. So uh, Klonk says, no, no, what I did is I, I added a calculate statement somewhere and uh, I just refresh and, uh, oh, so it's it's seems like it's it's quite a bit better actually, so it's uh, so I just use the performance analyzer like this and it, it seems to be working pretty well, and um, Bing Bing size a bit she says okay well Clonk I think we need to revisit how we measure performance, and uh, so when we're talking about measuring the performance we could look at our DAX query evaluation time which is what uh, Bing and Clonk are more focused on now, uh, but they could also be looking at the report visual and page render time. So, however, for looking at our DAX query evaluation time, Bink, she opens her laptop and uh, she sits next to Klonk and she shows him DAX Studio, which is a very, very handy tool for evaluating and optimizing uh, our DAX expressions. So for this, she shows him specifically uh, a really handy way to do this called uh, DAX Studio benchmarking. So she busts open DAX Studio, then she connect to the model, the PBIX on her desktop, and she clicks on benchmark. Uh, so she uh, is going to put in 20 cold cache and warm cache executions. And that's something that Klonk is a bit confused. He says, 20 times, I already did it. Why do we have to do it again? She says, you'll see, you'll see. And she pushes run. And she says, she explains that it's going to run both on the cold cache. So when there have been no queries executed before, so it's like a tabula rasa situation. Uh, or a warm cache already when the model is remembering something that we've been doing. So it's going to be a bit quicker. So Clonk already can expect what the result will be there and what she's going to illustrate. But uh, she then gets the results and she puts them side by side. And she says, okay, this was the DAX query evaluation time before and after your change. So in green was after your version two. So yes, it was a 15% difference. And he says, yeah, that's not much now. But if we're talking millions of rows, this will be a pretty significant difference, no? And she says, no, because if we measure this 20 times, we can actually see that the average is 2% difference. And in fact, that's not statistically significant at all. So this one time when we measure it, it's in fact either due to a random chance or most more likely because you're comparing a cold cache to a warm cache. The calculate statement you added here didn't really do anything. It might have even hurt you. So on top of this, uh, if we measure this 20 times, we can see that there's no meaningful difference at all. 
So the lesson that, that Bink is trying to teach Klonk here is that uh, neglecting the variance of the data can lead to wrong conclusions. And this is something that they have to keep in mind, not only with their developing their own solutions and their own procedures, but also when they're developing their reports and when they're showing that data to the users. So um, the result here is that they build so together some robust test practices. Uh, they decide to use this DAX Studio benchmarking approach, which helps them feel more confident in the performance of the DAX queries that they're writing. Um, and also that they can continue to monitor that improve uh, the, the performance um, as the report continues to change and as it continues to get more data. So for the completeness, they did the user story review. For accuracy, they're doing automated regression monitoring. For the performance, uh, they decide to go with query benchmarking with DAX Studio. Um, so how do we test accessibility? That's a very subjective thing. So how do we test something like this? How do we measure that? Well, one way that we can do this is by measuring something called time to learn. And what that is, is when we give uh, a user in a case, it's a it's a, a, a test case of where we give the user a list of tasks. Uh, so we get together in this, this um, uh, test period to measure this, and uh, they have to do something like switch to unit shipped. And the user then can navigate and do this, but uh, we measure the time that it takes to complete that task and the, for each trial it takes. So they repeat this then two days later and two days later. And actually we would expect to see a difference between an accessible and an inaccessible report where it might take them a certain amount of time, but over time they're eventually going to get faster and faster as they learn to use the report. And at a certain level, they're going to reach mastery where they have mastered the use of the report. They know where to find everything, what to, where to click on what in order to get the information and uh, that this would take them a certain number of trials. For the inaccessible design, this will also happen, but it will take longer. It will take more trials. So the reason being that they have a harder time navigating the report, it's not so accessible for them. So in this case, then it takes five, uh, five trials to be able to work through the accessible design before reaching mastery and 10 trials for the inaccessible design. So in effect, showing that the accessible design is uh, two times more effective in terms of learning it for a naive user. So, but how can we measure that? What's an easy way to do that? Well, uh, uh, Bing, she explains that we can also use DAX Studio for this. So she takes out DAX Studio and what she does is instead of connecting to a local model is she goes and she connects to the endpoint for her specific workspace and she's going to select the data set that she's going to be testing and she starts doing something called query tracing. So she clicks on all queries and she starts the query tracing process. It takes a little while, but once it starts, then she sees this on her computer. And uh, so she's sitting next to Clonk and she says, okay, Clonk, so let's go to the workspace and let's click on the report. So she just kind of hands over her laptop and he can see on the other side of the screen as uh, he goes to the report and uh, she says, go to the report and I want you to switch to unit shipped. So the report renders, the page loads and Clonk then navigates to the gross profit, selects it and switches to the unit shipped. Takes him a little bit of time. He's not used to working with Bing's laptop, but uh, this is actually what he sees happen on our screen as a result. All of the DAX queries are traced from her DAX Studio instance so that she can see what actually happened to the model. So she highlights this to Clonk and she says, you know, look, I can see exactly which DAX queries were executed. I can see how long they took. Um, but more importantly, if we're talking time to learn, I can see that the report page rendered uh, nine seconds before you actually completed the action. So the first trial, it took you nine seconds to be able to do this. Maybe my trackpad is not so effective for you, but and uh, Clonk just kind of nods and agrees and he said, OK, I thought this would be pretty laborious, but it seems like, you know, we can do this in a, in a fairly easy way. So they put together a protocol and they get together a group of users and they run this over a number of trials in order to measure and quantify uh, how long it takes for users to to master their report. Uh, the result here is that they devised a process to measure the report accessibility and they will reuse this for other reports that they already have in production 
to measure a baseline, but also for future reports that they'll develop uh, so that they really have uh, a par for what they expect in terms of this time to learn for the things that they develop for the users that they're making for. So complete, accurate, performant, and accessible. Uh, Clonk and Bink, they've devised ways to be able to measure each of these things. The completeness with the user story review, accuracy with the regression monitor, performance with query benchmarking, and accessibility by testing time to learn. So the overall result is that they have come up with a number of metrics to be able to allow them uh, to assess the quality of the report. So they feel quite confident that they have some numbers to back up the fact that they've made a quality report. They can show this to their stakeholders, but more importantly, they feel more confident themselves when they're going to production that this is going to be something uh, that will have a higher chance of being adopted. So the next step and the most important step, however, Bank illustrates is that we want to set and reach our adoption targets. Now, how do we do that? And when we're talking adoption, we're talking usage in a way. So we need to be able to see if our report is really going to be used. So we're gonna to have to do some usage monitoring. And in Power BI, when it comes to usage monitoring, there's a lot that we can look at. We can look at if it's used and how much it's used, but we can also look at how it's used with the Power BI auto logs. So in the sake of time, I'm just focused on the former, uh, the usage monitoring. So here, uh, what Klonk and Bing decide to do is they decide to take a look at a few reports that are already in production today in order to derive some lessons learned, in order to better understand how are we going to set some adoption targets, how are we going to monitor this. So what they do is they go to one of the more popular reports that are used uh, in that commercial region today. Uh, it's a sales report that's being used on, almost on a daily basis, and they pull up the default Power BI usage metrics report. So this is what they see. They haven't used this much before, so they just kind of pour over it. They see, aha, uh -huh, yeah, okay, so it's been open 10,000 times, 9.3 thousand page views, people are looking at it, so it's okay, it's being used. But they start discussing and they're trying to figure out, is it being used less? Do we have a problem here? Is there is the usage declining? And they start changing the slicer for the date a little bit, and they do see that there's there's a, a, a bit of a trend with the line, but more importantly, they see this report open trend is minus 17%. And that's, a, you know, they try to dig a little bit more into that to see, to understand where that's coming from and whether that's something that can be useful for them uh, for their adoption targets. So what they do actually is they open Power BI Desktop and they go and connect to the usage metrics model and do some ad hoc analyses themselves. So they see then the weekly views uh, in the bars and the line being the weekly viewers or the people who are looking at it. And they can see that yes, it's being used. There seems to be a rise and then a fall. But this is something they actually expect because there's a peak at the end of the month, which is typically when users are really looking at the reports in this commercial region because they're trying to make their month end targets. And then when the month end is over, that pressure's off. Uh, they don't really look at the reports as much until we reach the halfway point again. So they figure out actually that, uh, you know, Power BI is showing them something that is reflective of actually what they expect. So what they decide to do is actually adapt the metric to their expected usage. They decide that instead of comparing uh, these two halves of the, the, the chart, what they're going to do is they're going to just look month over month. So they're gonna look at March 14th and compare this to February 14th and see the change. And what they see here is that there's almost no change. So it looks pretty okay. It seems like there's fairly consistent usage. But they have heard subjectively from experience, users complain a lot about this report. Uh, it's got a lot of problems. So it's needed very heavy, let's call it life support lately. So they actually noticed this in the usage metrics lately, uh, that there's a lot of IT people, there's a lot of support people who are picked up in those usage metrics, they're not users. So what Klonk and Bing decide to do is to filter those people out and then see what does the graph look like if we remove all those people. Very different situation, very different situation. So what they see here is in fact that month over month, the usage has dropped 37%. So very clearly, 
reflective of the experience that they're hearing in the hallways, uh, this report has a usage problem. So that's the second thing they learn is that when they're monitoring the usage that they decide that we're really going to focus on the users, not the extra people. So they define who their users are before releasing the report. Of course, they need to give them access so they're aware of this. But on top of this, they combine these two lessons together. They decide to set a usage target based on these lessons that they've learned. So they decide to define a metric that they call the monthly user saturation, where they take the number of users that are using the report in the last month and compare it to the total number of users who should be using it and then express that as a percent. What they see for this report is that it's actually 73% and they feel that it should be at least 90% based on you know, discussions that they've had with management as largely a management driven decision. So indeed there seems to be a problem here, but more importantly, they've picked up some useful lessons that they can take moving forward with their report so that when they set it into production that they have an adoption target user saturation 90%, and they've devised a way that they're going to monitor that usage moving forward. So the result is that they built some personalized and relevant, not only metrics, but a usage report based on the usage metrics data set. Uh, they did some segmentation of the users, filtering out the usernames that uh, are not defined in their user list, and they build a metric called user saturation, which they feel is uh, more reflective of the actual usage and something that they will use as an adoption target that they hope to meet, which is 90%. So they feel ready. It's time for the regional release. So it's it's their first go live for their, their baby. They've put a lot of effort into it and they really feel like uh, they're ready. So there's not much more that they can do. So how did it go? Well, you know, all the data alchemy, it seems like it has paid off. Because in the first few months, the first month and a half or so, uh, there's very limited data disruption. In fact, uh, in no instance does the business see or interact with incorrect data in their report because of the automated monitoring. There were two instances where they had to step in and do some corrections, uh, but thanks to that automated monitoring, they could do so. Uh, next, they did open with very strong usage and had very consistent performance because they were very critical and scrutinizing of the performance quality of their report. On top of that, they decided to measure the past due payments over time in the uh, in the commercial region and compare it to the others. And when trying to account for confounding variables, they actually saw that the past due payments were declining at a slightly faster rate than in the other commercial regions, which was something really exciting for them. But of course, for our executive, I mean, she bought a pretty nice bottle of champagne, so she was very excited. So she was actually ready to pull the trigger on this next stage, on this big analytics project. So they start discussing budget and they start having a lot of ideas. They start to hire some more people and to talk to some consultants. Um, they really start to spread out their roadmap. And uh, in the meantime, they're just focused on this. They're thinking about the future. They feel really good about this report. It's been a success. So um, quite a lot of time goes by, about six weeks, uh, eight weeks or so, as uh, they, they get pretty deep into this process. But about th three months after-ish, um, they, they got this green light. They start to hear some very alarming things, and they see some pretty alarming emails, um, which is first that the users of that, that report that was you know such a success, they're now seeming a little bit frustrated. Um, they're not sure why. So they, they also notice in the monitoring from someone who is looking at the audit logs that there's rising export frequency, which they're a bit concerned about. And there's even some alternate truth reporting where people in that commercial region are reporting past due numbers that no one can trace back to any source system. So they're a little, they're a little concerned about this. There seems to be an issue. So they decide to stop their planning, stop their dreaming, to just take a take a minute back and to to try to figure out what exactly is going on, so they discuss with each other, and more importantly, they go to discuss with the users. And what they're actually seeing, what they're experiencing, is a growing divide between the people who are using the data and the people who are designing the data. The question is why? Why is this happening? 
we did everything right. We did this design co-creation, user story review, testing and measuring, transparent monitoring. So what the hell did we do wrong? Where did we go wrong? And what they actually experience is that adoption, it's a user maker relationship and relationships take work. It doesn't stop after go live because if we stop that collaboration, you better bet that the usage will reflect that as well. So the revelation that they have actually is that they kind of just set this report in, they monitored it, they got their measurements, they really felt good, it was a success, and then they took off to the next thing. So they realized that continuous adoption, it means continuous collaboration. The business is using this to improve the business, but of course the business is evolving. As their past due pay payments started to decline, the business was focused on slightly different things and the report was no longer reflecting their needs, something that could happen very, very quickly. And since they were no longer collaborating, they didn't know. So they decided to do something. They decided to take some action. They set up some user maker touch points because they really believe that communication is the foundation for adoption. So they set up some weekly drop in workshops. Uh, and some user team groups in order to centralize feedback and give people an opportunity to express and share their thoughts and opinions about the reports, as well as their ideas. And they really encourage the users to be able to share their ideas and to come up with thoughts and things that they can do to improve the report. On top of that, during these times, they have some fun activities and discussion just to kind of break that ice and more importantly, to break down the barrier so that they aren't just the Power BI people, on one side of the screen and the users aren't just the salespeople, but they really see each other as humans and empathize with each other's perspective. So this also creates a more open environment for sharing opinions, for sharing thoughts, uh, where someone feels like they can do that without being run over by criticism, which is when they start to hear some things. So what did they learn? First, they see that the business is indeed evolving, no surprise, but uh, they, they because the past due payments were declining, the business was starting to focus on other things, more on opportunities than on pains, but they still very much were focused on these past dues, so they were still using the report, but they did define some new master data based on some of the things that they learned from the report. They came up with a few new subtler product categories and customer segments, which better reflected what they had seen. But Clonk and Bink, they had no idea about this. So this wasn't reflected in the report at all. And the users were complaining about that because then it wasn't as useful for them. They couldn't see these segments reflected in the report. Third, the business is growing so fast and we're hiring so many new people, but there is no onboarding procedure for people to learn these reports. So they're just exposed to these reports. They don't know the context. They haven't been there for the process. And the first thing they think is just, okay, I got to do my job. So how do I get this in Excel? So the result here is that uh, Clonk and Bink, they decide they have to start coordinating and collaborating a little bit more with the users in order to really, you know, get past these barriers, which are small barriers actually. So what they see is, um, that these first two things, the evolving business, new master data, were very, very small things, but they just didn't know because there was no dialogue, there was no conversation. Adding that master data was a very simple change that could happen within a matter of a few days. And once it was done, the business really appreciated it. For the new employees, they just worked together with HR in order to define an onboarding process so that they could be trained to use the reports and also so that they were aware that there were some open hours where they could drop by and ask some questions uh, in these Teams calls uh, with the, the citizen developers in this case, with Klonk and uh, his team. So the result is that they improved the report and the value that the users got from it, but on top of that, helped to improve the overall data literacy in the organization and the collaboration, broke down those barriers between IT and business, and improved the value that they took out of other data solutions in the organization. Now, the road to adoption, it seems like a linear path where we design something, we build it, we test it, and then we set it into production. But the reality is that it's a perilous adventure. And 
we need to be able to make sure that we have a way to be able to measure the quality of the reports that we make uh, to see that they're complete, they're accurate, performant and accessible so that we can feel more confident that it's going to be something that's adopted. We have to be able to monitor the usage of our reports so that we can really say that it's being used and so that we have adoption targets to set so that we can say that that adoption is being realized. And more importantly, we have to continuously collaborate with the business to ensure that they are taking value out of the report and getting the support that they need to use it. Because getting from Excel hell, as we heard, uh, to, to Inside Island, it's a very perilous adventure with a lot of things in between which is why we have to be able to count on a few approaches but also our fellow adventures along the way uh, so that we make it there in one piece so thank you very much for your attention also very much to the organizers um i'm one minute over time i think no no i'm not but uh, so, and also I should call out the artists who I collaborate with to make the data goblin drawings. Uh, it's been a fun exercise. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm making it to a poster. I, I will, I promise, so. Yeah, it was great, uh, Kurt. Very nice. Thanks. Yeah, um, I love the, the storyline and, and all the, um, the graphics. Uh, of the goblins and uh, also all the people in the in the chat uh, uh, said it was uh, excellent so uh, thanks for that um i believe there was one question about um, um it was from arno let me scroll back um <clears throat> uh, he asked um what level of prior knowledge about power bi in general or that specific report do you expect from users um, to be able to operate or understand the report. That's so, a very, that's a very, very good question. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. So, for example, uh, a drill down to a drill through or filter interactions, that sort of uh, things. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. You should always assume when you're encountering a user, unless you know for sure otherwise, and you're, especially when you're approaching a group, I think, um, assume zero. Um, really you always want to take baby steps um, and there's always something that someone might have heard before but they could have forgotten because they're not using it or they might be doing it you know incorrectly um, but it always helps to just just start from the beginning um, and what you could even do if you're doing it in a in a group if there is someone who's heard this six seven times um, maybe that person wants to 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 introduce that concept themselves so give an opportunity for the users to say, does anyone know how to drill through? And then one brave soul might volunteer and share their screen and demonstrate, um, which can be very nice because then it's it's really coming from the users to the users. And that's that's where you want to get to as well. So yeah, more than the train the trainer principle then. Yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, there was some great discussions also in uh, in the chat around uh, topics. Um, I don't think there was a specific uh, other question. Um, I'm, enjoy I'm enjoying <laughs> the comments on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Well, Power BI misses a lot of things. There's there's purgatory there as well, Arno. <laughs> Somewhere yeah, in between. City, yeah. Herb City is also, yeah. Yeah, I need, need to add those those uh, dots. Well, um, great insights and uh, and uh, fun to watch. So um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Yeah, no problem. Um, let me. If anyone has anybody has any uh, other thoughts or questions, then uh, please feel free to ask them. Otherwise, I will um, thank both both speakers and um, close off. I just want to say that I'm very much looking forward to the next the next one. I think the topic is is very very important. I very much agree with you, especially now. I'm yeah. very, I'm very happy that that is uh, that that's coming. I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah me too. Same, same for me. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so that's why I wanted to uh, point it out again. It's uh, on May 5th, um, also on the Wednesday, first Wednesday of, uh, of May, starting at uh, 8 p.m. Um, and Tracy uh, has done this talk um, uh, multiple times now and has uh, received great content uh, um, about it. So, um, yeah, we're really looking forward uh, to it. Um, there's a, a short link uh, on the top where you can uh, register. It's at powerbiideas.com. Um, um, with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you. If you have any uh, ideas for topics or speakers or want to share something yourself, it can be uh, anything from 10 minutes to uh, to, uh, to 60 minutes, then uh, please reach out uh, to, to Mark or myself or uh, go to the website and um, you can leave your uh, question or contact details there. So with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you and um, have a nice day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you also again, uh, Mark and Nikki, for organizing and uh, hosting us. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Arno, and uh, good.